So rhythm, let's talk about rhythm. You know, I love the way Gil, you know, he had such a magic sense of writing rhythm and the ensemble figures yeah. uh, are so snappy and they are hip. Talking about hip yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. And what what are some of his keys to to the way he, he phrased ensemble figures and, and backing figures? Well, you know, when so when you said that about the hip stuff, I was thinking of... Um, uh, what is it's in uh, Best You Is My Woman now, right? That he quotes a couple bars of like uh, it's like anthropology or something. It's a reference to that, right? In there, it's a double time line in there that's like a bop. It, it it's vaguely oh, hinting yeah. at bop head, you know. But I it always struck me that he only did that for a couple of bars, and so like throughout the tune, the double time thing is sort of implied, but it's only really stated for those couple of bars. And that quote is slipped in there, but it doesn't like take over the mood of the tune, you know? And again, I think, you know, if you know the lyrics to Best You Is My Woman now, right? That Porgy's just totally in love with this woman that really doesn't, uh, ultimately doesn't care that much about him, but he's just so taken with her, right? And that tune is expressing that. And I always thought, man, you know, if those Bob figures were throughout that whole tune, you would lose the whole meaning of the tune. But he places that line in there just in the right place. And there's just enough of it to kind of hint at this jazz thing. And it's really cool. It's really hip. Nobody would think to put that in there. Or if they did think to put it in there, they would, they would um, overdo it. They would put it in there more than once, or they'd put in 16 bars, or they'd give a guy a solo or something, you know, they would way overdo it, you know. And so I thought, like, it seems to me like some of his thinking is a, a, maybe a sense of good taste of like how much of that stuff to put in there, you know, and to not try to out hip other people. And that there was some understatement and some subtlety to it, you know. Mm. On the the rhythmic level, generally, I guess I would say, well, that seems to be, that sense of taste seems to carry throughout almost all the things I think he wrote for Miles and even the other stuff he was writing in the same time period, the albums he made, you know, just very understated and enough rhythm to, to, to carry the piece and give you a sense of groove, but not uh, overdone, not intrusive, and still this like presentation, this unfolding of these in interesting tone colors while this rhythm's going on, you know? Um, and then of course, you know, the other piece, I don't know if this relates to your question, but I'm thinking of the number of times that he uses the trombone section or combination of horns and trombones to kind of simulate a piano player's left hand, that kind of comping, the Red Garland style comping that, that uh, Red used, you know, uh, that, that, you know, comping on the and of two and the and of four, you know, and uh, it's so hip and, and like thinking of orchestrating that, I, I think was like the coolest thing, you know? Yeah, so, like a new rumba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, great. The other one like that is on the same album, I Don't Want to Be Kissed, right? Uh, he, you know, he orchestrates a Maja Jamal's comping uh, for the for the bones and or uh, I think it's one horn and three trombones in that one, you know, but it's the same type of thing, you know, those and it's all related, right? Because you read these things where Miles, you know, supposedly told Red Garland to comp like a Maja Jamal, right? So there's this tie in there. You know, and I also remember reading this thing where Gil said in the 60s, oh, if Miles had a, a large group where the orchestra did what Herbie's doing, that would be really cool. And I always thought, oh, man, you know, if I had endless time, I would write Gil-style charts for all those, you know, Mascalero and Nefertiti and Fall yeah. and all these, all these mid-60s Miles things. That would be so cool to hear Gil-type arrangements of those tunes you know yeah, and to try to leave enough room for a soloist too to to still be as experimental with that you know so yeah yeah good one <laughs> do that one day please yeah 
yeah, Girl obviously had a, a big variety of harmonic techniques, you know, clusters, all sorts of things yeah. going on. Triads, triads yeah. plus a note. Yeah. Um, we have sort of come to grips with his different styles, but the skill again, and maybe the answer is just taste, but how is he getting all these different sounds within one chart to sort of make a, a comprehensive whole? Hmm. Yeah, boy, I don't know if I have a like a solid answer for that. I mean, I so when you touch on the harmony thing, you know, I was thinking, well, yeah, there's certain little th things like, like there's a chord in the Duke there at the end of the intro to the Duke where I think it's like a D flat seven chord, and he's got like a a natural nine in one voice, and then an, up an octave higher, he's got like a flat nine or something like that. You know, something that you would. It does. Yeah, I was really a mistake. Yeah, it's like any arranger would be like, don't do that, you know, and, and it's so cool how that thing, you know, rings. So they were clearly, like you said, added notes in the harmony, right? It wasn't just the textbook uh, big band harmonization. He he would add a note here or there that made for something a little unusual sonically, harmonically, right? Um, as far as how you get all that to hang together, how he how he got those to be unified, Gee, I don't know, because, you know, when you just analyze some of those things, you, you know, you think, well, if I just added a natural nine and a sharp nine over here, and I did this counter line there, and I did this bebop quote there, well, it could really sound like everything was just sort of stapled together, right? And like you're saying, it doesn't sound like that, right? So, so how does he do it? I, I, I don't know. I, that's something... Uh, there might be an answer, but I guess probably I end up saying taste only because he just seems to have a good sense of judgment, you know. I guess this is another one of these things, like I end up talking to my students about, you know, they've been raised, you know, don't be judgmental, don't judge, don't judge. And I'm like, I don't know, I think jazz musicians are judging all the time, you know. I think they're throwing stuff out they don't like, and I think they're deciding what they like and keeping it and committing to it. And, I think they're judging everything, you know, other players, music, chords, lines, sounds, sound combinations, whatever, right? So uh, when I studied with Jim McNeely, you know, he would have you write, you know, 10 pages of variations on one theme, and he would say, you can't judge it at all for like two weeks, and you just keep writing these variations, and then, then at the end of the couple of weeks or whatever time limit you set, now you judge the hell out of them. You know, you this one's terrible. I don't like that. This one's horrible. That's out. You know, I love this one. You know, he just wanted the from a compositional point of view, he wanted the the judgment to be separate from the idea, right? His his theory was if you judge every idea as it comes out, you'll hate all of them and you won't have anything, right? But the opposite of that is also true. If you if you never judge, then you'll take anything good or bad, you know. And so I think it seems to me that Gil had a good sense of judgment there as far as what would fit together, you know. Mm. How he developed that, I'm not sure, other than I guess maybe a lot of trial and error, right? Yeah. I mean, I think in those days, uh, you could... You know, those bands were gigging, not not Miles and Gill, but, but prior to that, the Thornhill band, right? They were gigging, you know, six nights a week. So you could probably revise a chart, you know, from one night to the next. Or, you know, you hear those stories about Duke at a recording session where he would have three versions of a chart. And, you know, three-hour session, he's rehearsing these different things. And they said, you know, sometimes it would come down to the last half hour and the producer would be like, look, we got to get something recorded here, you know. And they said it was always like, you know, well, play letter A of the first chart and then go to the second one and play letter C, then play letter B, then play letter K of the third one, then come back to the first chart and do letter D. And, and you know, I don't know that those stories are true, but I do have... Um, some copies of Duke's hand uh, parts for a tune called Conga Brava from 1940. And you can see literally uh, how crazy the chart was. I, I, I don't know, have you ever seen any of those things at all? No. 
they they used to. I'm going to see if I can share my screen with you if you, sure. if you think we have time. Yeah, I'm going to pull those up because what it was is you know Duke's um, family donated the contents of his apartment. Apparently, they paid rent on this apartment after he died for like ten or fifteen years, right? Wow. And then they donated the contents of it to the Smithsonian Institute, and the Smithsonian Institution cataloged his works in the 1980s and 90s. And for a while, you could write to them and get copies of one chart per year, whatever they had. Wow. Most of the time, they didn't have conductor scores, but they had stray parts and stuff, right? So um, so I wrote to them, and I because I had transcribed this Conga Brava tune. It's like it's a Juan Teasel Duke thing with like Latin and swing alternating, you know. It's, you know, in a way, it reminds you, like the Latin swing groove reminds you almost of like the Horace Silver thing, except that it's like 15 years before Horace Silver and five years before Manteca and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, um, and, it's, and of course, it's got the plunger stuff. It's got the Duke sounds of clarinet up high and all that. Um, so it's a really cool tune, and I had transcribed it. So I wanted to check my transcription against whatever they had. And so they sent me a few of the parts. So I, I've scanned them, and I have them in my uh, computer here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull those up and show you. So, you know, it says Barney, right? It's Barney Begard. Yeah. And you see letter K, clarinet, right? And then uh, letter B, which mm. in the chart ended up not being letter B. Yeah. And then you see uh, letter U, which is nowhere in the recording. It's oh. obviously cut out. They didn't play it, you know. And so then let me let me uh, pull up another one. Um, so you think someone would have sketched that out on the fly on the day? Yeah, or or it's what they said that he was like, "Well, play this now, play this now, play this kind of deal," you know. Uh, can you see that one? The, the yeah. one Carney. Yep. So again, you see letter K. Now we see letter S, um, which I I forget if that's in there or not. But letter U again, not in there. Mm. Um, and then there's the Rex Stewart part here, which you can see is torn. You know that just has the melody of the tune and a B section. It has a first ending and a second ending, which they only play the theme once. They don't play it twice. So that was obviously changed. You know, mm. and um, then what else do I have? I got the Lawrence Brown part, so that's got the letter K thing, and then it's got letter letter uh, a different letter K, which yeah. is like an out chorus that they play at the end. Mm. So anyway, you know, they're all like this, where there's different things in there. You know, so wow, it's kind of interesting because it seems like Duke worked in that way of like trial and error i guess this is this is why i brought this up right that you said how does gill come to these things how does he do, or how does he develop that sense of taste and judgment i think it's probably a lot of trial and error and in those days there was money in the band business so you had work every day and so i think they they experimented they tried things out and probably by the time they got to a recording session in certainly in gill's case they had a pretty solid chart that flowed real well, you know. In Duke's case, it seems like maybe he did things a little more on the fly. But he also had guys that had worked with him for 20, 30, 40 years, right? So they, they knew his thinking really well, right? In the case of the Miles and Gill things, those were studio guys that had worked with Gill once in a while, but they weren't working with him every night anymore, right? So so he had to have those charts more together, I think, you know. Mm. Okay. I don't know if that gives kind of insight, you know. But. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one, and my next question is about form. And I think about, you know, you talked about the Duke and that chord, that D flat chord with the both ninths yeah. in it, and then of course what follows is the trio, yeah. and it's a lot sweeter. Yeah, you know, of course you got the yeah. big drama of that moment, and yeah, yeah. that of course helps actually accentuate that change doesn't it right right yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah there's another sense of taste and and how to create i guess i tried to talk about that in the book you know how do you create climaxes climax points 
in the chart, you know, and that, that there needs to be, uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess I would, I would say that's like Western storytelling tradition, you know, there's a beginning, a middle and end. There's a, there's a setup, there's plot twists, there's sub climaxes, there's a final climax and there's an ending, you know? And so it seems like Gil had a sense of every one of those songs told the story somehow, you know, and that that the composer's job was to kind of navigate you through that story, you know. Um, the trio thing in the Duke always reminded me of how Duke would use the, uh, you know, like the Mood Indigo trio, right? The, the trumpet, clarinet, trombone. That's in Conga Brava also. Mm -hmm. And um, it, there are a number of Duke charts that use that combination where the um, even the head to cottontail kind of uses it uses uh, what is it I think uh, a, a, a muted trumpet an open bone and alto and barry so it's a quartet but but it's like a, a a combination of high brass low brass and woodwind right and so the mood indigo thing was uh, muted trumpet muted trombone clarinet clarinets in the low register trombones forced up high right. Um, so it seems like that Gill had maybe his own idea of a distinctive trio in that, in the Duke, right? And, and doing something like Ellington would do, but with his sound palette, you know, his color palette as opposed to Duke's, you know? Mm. So I don't know, I don't know if that's what he was thinking, but it always seemed to me like that trio kind of came out of that, um, Thing, right and then he, at the end he does the two flutes and the bass clarinet right which are another little trio so it almost seems like Gill doing his version of how Duke would juxtapose the trio against the whole band you know what I mean so, yeah. yeah um let's talk a bit about form okay so Gill's compositions you know he's got some some of them are really sort of tight small heads sort of like um ZZ and jelly rolls, you get those, they're more like improvisation platforms that set like quite a, yeah, an interesting mood. Yeah. And then, of course, and things like um, Blues for Pablo, you get yeah. the like almost completely open, he's, he's changing it all the time. It's actually yeah. quite a lot more difficult to decipher the form. Right, you, right. What a what a gill bring to like form in a sort of a jazz ensemble method. Well, yeah. So I think one of the things, well, certainly blues for Pablo. You got conventional blues form in there, but it's it's uh, truncated sometimes. It's uh, it's um, you know, there's another theme that's not blues that's juxtaposed, right? And the, the, those sections kind of alternate and the interlude keeps coming back between certain blues choruses and stuff, right? So, so I think, uh, I don't know, I wonder, you know, Jim McNeely always said to me that he thought the last real area of innovation in jazz would be with form and that that was what Gill had sort of suggested with his works, you know? Um, and again, I think, well, so like Duke, Duke didn't do nearly as much of that, but like Cottontail starts out with a 28 bar chorus, then proceeds to 32 bar AABA, right? So there's always some little twist in there. And it seems like Gill did more of that. The later stuff that you mentioned, I think by that time, Gill was probably influenced by the fusion-y things and the kind of late modal things of you know, vamping on a chord or vamping on a, a two chord thing or something, right? Like having more open stuff for soloists rather than orchestrated things, right? And definitely there was a kind of move. I, I wonder how much of that was just the way American music was going, that it was just less orchestration and more small group and more free and open kind of things. It, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know. But I think, so his use of form, though, um, I mean, I think probably part of the thinking is to have form maybe be, maybe not as creative as improvisation, but that, that it would be, that it could be malleable in some cases, 
right? Or that that maybe it wouldn't just be conventional song form all the time, you know? Um, and so I think, again, maybe there's this thing of like trying to present a song or a melody in a song-like way, but with some added sophistication underneath, right? And it almost seems like, I don't know if this is, again, addressing directly what you're asking, but it seems to me like there's this thing where some of these pieces, like Blues for Pablo, the average person could listen to that, and if they like melody, they could hear a couple of themes that keep coming back that they like, and they'd have no idea what the form was. But then some jazz guy listening to it would be like, oh, it's a blues. Oh, wait, it's not a blues. Is it a blues? Oh, I guess, yeah, there's the blues again. Well, what's that now? You know, right? Like there's that other level of interest. And it seems to me that that, that was a jazz thing for a long time, that those pieces of music could function on multiple levels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a story about Benny Goodman, right, when bebop came along, that he was an anti-bebop guy. But his reason for being against bebop was i remember reading this thing where he said i have two audiences for my music there's a small group of people that stand right up in front of the bandstand and they want to hear what the tenor sax player is going to play in his solo and then there's this larger group that's out on the dance floor they don't care if there's solos at all they just want to dance you know and so he was aware maybe even in a slightly cynical way that, that his music functioned on multiple levels for different people. Mm. And so I wonder how much, you know, someone like Gil or even Miles would have had that sense of, well, you know, because even think about Miles, right? While he was recording Nefertiti and ESP and all these things, he was still playing So What and All of You and Funny Valentine in concerts, right? Um but they were playing modalized versions of My Funny Valentine or uh, heavily chord substituted versions of All of You, right? Um, and so you had the harmonies of Herbie and Wayne, but the melodies and groove of 1950s miles that audiences still wanted to hear, right? And that lasted well into the 1960s. So it seems like they were conscious of appealing to audiences on more than one level that there would be musicians who would be into this really hip stuff, but there would be people who would just want to hear a nice melody and, and hum it in their head while they listened, you know? Mm. So. Yeah. That's certainly the way I, I remember hearing the album miles ahead. Mm -hmm. And at first I, I loved it. You know, I was just yeah. like, what is this cool thing? But I didn't get it. I didn't, take in blues for pablo like because the form is too complex in a way you know yeah. i heard the these themes come and go yeah. loving that and of course i had enough interest to keep listening to it yeah but yeah it's like the form is sort of communicating to you on a deeper level really that yeah. will reward you um over time yeah for repeated listening and that kind of thing right yeah yeah yeah. yeah, it's and and Bess is is the way he treats form and Bess is very interesting too. You know, you got the key changes. Yep. Time. Key changes are uh, ironically the key changes are not the same keys, but it's the scheme of giant steps. Oh, right. Yeah. It's the, the major third uh, modulation. It's really cool. Yeah. You know? And that's before giant steps, right? So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some interest that he had there in that particular modulation that's really hip you know yeah yeah and so. yeah it's just the way he brings out that super brassy moment where it changes into c sharp i think it is yeah yeah, yeah. you know it's just such an awesome moment that and then it breaks down and it's just the troms for a while and, yeah uh, yeah so i think one of the things i pointed out in the book with those climaxes is how how seldom he uses open brass like the entire open brass section right it's usually only a small part of a chart and that and and it's sort of like a there's something about withholding that that builds tension so when it finally comes like you said it's just ah oh, it just opens everything it's like this incredible climax but i think 
what I what the way I thought of it is like, you know, first like you, well, how does he get this climax? And then I've realized, well, he's he's holding it back for so long. You know, it's a big band. You're expecting to hear that, but it doesn't come. It doesn't come. It's hinted at. There's a little choir here that's got maybe a couple open trumpets in it or something, but you don't get the full open brass at like forte or fortissimo until this climactic peak of the chart, you know. And uh, again, he seems to just have had this sense of when to do that, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think giving you just enough each time, isn't it? Like you think, oh, I'd like a little more, but yeah, it, it yeah. goes away or sometimes it stretches just for a couple bars. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's always well, and there was close. always that sort of thing that band leaders would say. They would say, well, it's always better to leave them wanting more than it is to say too much, you know? And I, I remember even older jazz guys saying, you know, when you'd play a solo, and if you played a little too long, they'd say, well, you know, you kind of ran out of ideas there at the end or something. And and I remember this one guy this that, that I had for a teacher for a while, he said, well, think about it. You know, do you want people saying, you know, if you play a four chorus solo, do you want somebody to say, man, the first three choruses of that solo were really good. The last one was okay, but, you know, or would you rather play three choruses and have somebody say, man, those were so good. I wish you played one more, you know, right? So the answer was obvious. So I wonder in an arranging sense, if it's the same kind of thing that you'd rather leave them saying, oh man, could we get one more bar of that nice brass section as opposed to, ah, oh, the damn thing was so full of brass. It just kind of ate everything up, you know? Yeah. So um, I think that's maybe part of it, you know, plus, when you add the hats in there right now, it really becomes, right, like trumpets with hats is a different instrument than trumpet open, right? And and trumpets with hat and one uh, lead on the harmon is a different sound than just the hats, right? So he's got all these different colors he can get out of the brass where most big band writers would just use them for the heavyweight punch, you know? So I think that was something he had that, that he understood how to deploy that and like when to use it and how to leave people wanting a little more, drawing people in somehow, you know? Yeah. So. Mm, great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, should we wrap it up? We've been talking for an hour and a half. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks for your work. You're welcome. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, taking an interest in it again. Thank you. <laughs>